Hi, um, I'm Hannah Grun. I'm with the Center for Transportation Studies and the Roadway Safety Institute at the University of Minnesota. Um, this is the eighth seminar of the Advanced Transportation Technologies Seminar Series, sponsored by the Roadway Safety Institute. Seminars are open to anyone interested in learning more about transportation safety research. Undergraduate and graduate students, faculty, and practitioners are encouraged to attend, so please join us for the next few weeks as the seminar series wraps up. Um, for today's seminar, before I introduce the speaker, I'm just going to run through a couple of housekeeping items. Um, as you know by this point, we have an online audience as well as a live audience in the room. So for those of us in the room, please hold your questions until the end and use the microphone so that the people online can For those watching online, we do ask that you report how many people are viewing in your location in the chat box at the upper right hand corner of your screen. We are required to report our viewership numbers to the USDOT, so we'd like to have an accurate count. And you can also use this chat box for questions as well. Um, this week, I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Rajesh Rajamani, who is with the Department of Mechanical Engineering here at the University of Minnesota. He will be talking about magnetic sensor systems for collision prediction, traffic counting, and other applications. Um, professor Rajamani is a professor of mechanical engineering at the U. His research interests include vehicle dynamics, intelligent transportation systems, microsensors, and control system design. His current research activities in transportation include the development of imminent crash prediction sensors, development of systems for real-time estimation of tire road friction coefficient on highway vehicles, development of batteryless, wireless, traffic, and way in motion sensors, and the development of electronic stability control systems. Professor Rajamani received his Master's of Science and PhD degrees from the University of California at Berkeley in 1991 and 1993, respectively, and his Bachelor in Technology degree from the Indian Institute of Technology at Madras in 1989. He has been a re recipient of the Career Award from the National Science Foundation, the 2001 Outstanding Paper Award from the, jur uh, the Journal of Institute for I'm sorry, the IEEE Transactions on Control Systems Technology, and the Ralph Teeter Award from SAE, and the 2007 O. Hugo Shuck Award from the American Automatic Control Council. Please welcome Professor Rajamani. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for the introduction. So um, I'll talk about uh, magnetic sensors for a number of different applications. And um, towards the end of the talk, I'll also um, uh, talk about a different uh, application, which is a bicycle uh, collision prevention system for a bicycle. And we'll see if magnetic sensors are useful for that application also. Okay. Um, so uh, it turns out that a lot of um, birds, um, you know, sea animals, and others um, use magnetic fields for navigation purposes, for finding their location. So for example, Homing pigeons, they have um, magnetic sensors in their brains. So there is a portion of their brain that's able to uh, measure magnetic fields. Uh, so they're able to actually use the intensity of magnetic field and the direction of magnetic field to find their position. Okay. Um, likewise, uh, you know, dolphins and a number of other sea animals uh, also have magnetic sensors in their brains and they're able to find their location. Okay. So there's a number of papers in science and nature and so on. Uh, about how these animals are able to navigate using magnetic fields. Now, as human beings, we don't have um, magnetic sensors, right, in our brains. Um, but um, we've tried to use um, the North Pole and uh, magnetic sensors, right, to find where the North Pole is. So that is basically a rough use of Earth's magnetic field. It just gives you the orientation with, you know, of rough accuracy. Um, what we wanted to do was uh, see if there is a way to more precise kinds of objects around us that are ferromagnetic have magnetic fields around them. And the question that we were trying to answer was, can we exploit these inherent magnetic fields to find position, to find the distance to this object which has that magnetic field, okay? So um, we came up with this um, sensing principle where we basically uh, consider the, the, the dimensions and the shape of the object whose position we want to measure, right? And then we, uh, using the shape and the um, dimensions, we model the magnetic field of that object, okay? Then we measure magnetic field at a few locations, and using the measurements of those magnetic fields, we find the position of that object, okay? Um, 
and then it turns out we need some adaptive estimation techniques. So it turns out that we don't really want to get into calibration for each object we encounter. We don't want to calibrate how the magnetic field for that object varies with position. We want to be able to find the position without doing any calibration. And so we can use some adaptive estimation techniques to do that. So here's an example of, an, of, of a simple object. So this is basically a cylindrical object. So we assume uh, this is a cylinder that's uniformly magnetized. Okay. So if you look at a small um, element of this uniformly magnetized cylinder, you can model the small element as a dipole, as a magnetic dipole. And so, you know, if you look at uh, textbooks, you can um, find equations for how the magnetic field varies. So for this dipole, if you look at um, the magnetic field at this point, so this is a point along the longitudinal axis of the cylinder. You can uh, write down the equations for the magnetic field along the radial direction and perpendicular to the radial direction. You can write down those equations. So basically it turns out the magnetic field for a dipole varies as 1 over r cube. Okay. And then it depends um, on this angle alpha, okay, uh, which is basically the angle of the vector connecting these two points. Um, so then you can take components of these two magnetic fields and you can find the magnetic field along the x axis, along the longitudinal axis of the cylinder. And so this is the magnetic field due to this particular dipole. Now what you can do is you can take all the dipoles in this cylinder, right? And then you can integrate over the entire cylinder to find the magnetic field that this entire cylinder creates at this point, right? So at any point along the axis. And if you do that, you'll find that you get an equation of this type. So the magnetic field along this axis at any point which is at a distance x, um, from the cylinder, this is the formula. So the magnetic field is, it varies as 1 over x square. So there is some constant involved and then there is a 1 over x square involved. Okay. So, um, you know, so if you know this, if you know that this is how the magnetic field varies for this object, right? Um, and if you measure the magnetic field, you can find the position, right? So um, basically you have a sensor that measures magnetic field. You can invert this relationship, you know, take square root and so on, and you can find the position, okay? Um, likewise, uh, for other um, objects, you can f uh, define um, functions the, for the magnetic field. So for example, this rectangular object, you're trying to find the magnetic field along this axis here. Uh, it turns out the magnetic field is given by p over x plus q. So it's a 1 over x type of function, okay? p over x plus q. Again, if you measure the magnetic field, you can invert this relationship. You can find the position, right? Um, and then this is a disk. And so along the axis of the disk, uh, this is the rela relationship between x and b. And um, so if you really know all these functions, you can find the position by measuring magnetic field because there's a 1 to 1 monotonic relationship between these two quantities, yeah? Okay. Now the, the, the challenge comes um, from the fact that there are some parameters in the, in the magnetic field function that will not be known, okay? So for example, um, you know, just look at this equation here, B is equal to P over X plus Q. So there are two parameters involved, P and Q, okay? And you, you might not know exactly what those object, what those values are unless you um, calibrate, right? So you can take any rectangular ferromagnetic object. So you can say, okay, this is a rectangular ferromagnetic object. So I know that its function is going to be given by P over X plus Q, okay? So you know the function, but you don't know the values of the parameters P and Q because that is going to vary for every rectangular object, right? So let's say you want to measure the distance from a car, okay? And you model the car as a rectangular object, okay? Now, unless you made an appointment, to have an accident with that car, right? You won't really know which car it is, and you won't know what are the values of P and Q and so on. So you want to be able to um, find these parameters P and Q in real time, adaptively, without having to have any calibration. Okay. So uh, and the Q really comes about this Q term here. That's a constant term, and that really comes about because. It's, it's the bias due to the Earth's magnetic field. So that, va that varies with your orientation. It varies from location to location and so on. Okay? So there's a Q that is unknown that changes very slowly, but it is um, unknown and, do and does keep changing. 
okay. And then P is basically related to the strength of magnetization, so that is unknown, okay. So what we did is basically, um, you know, so given that we do not know the parameters, we know the function of the magnetic field, but we do not know the parameters. How will we estimate position, okay. What we um, decided is we would use redundant magnetic sensors. So instead of using just one sensor, we could use two sensors on the same board, right. Uh, and so there is some known distance between them. So that distance might be one centimeter or of that order, okay, pretty small distance. So you can have a small uh, PCB with multiple magnetic sensors on it, okay. And there is some known distance between the sensors. Now if you know the entire magnetic field function and all the parameters, you need only one sensor because you measure the field, you invert the function, you get the position, right. But if you do not know the parameters, right, so there are many, un so there are several unknowns now. You do not know the x, you do not know the p, you do not know the q and so on, okay. But p and q are constant, they, they change extremely slowly, it is only the position that changes quickly. So it turns out that um, by having multiple sensors, uh, you can actually estimate these parameters in real time and also estimate the position basically, okay. So, um, so that is basically the idea behind all of these um, magnetic uh, position estimation applications that you will see, okay. So let us look at one of these applications, um, imminent crash prediction, okay. So every car has a has an inherent magnetic signature, okay. Um, so the magnetic field around a car varies as a predict predictable function of position and vehicle specific parameters. And so basically we, what we found is that this function here, uh, P over X plus Q is a pretty good model for um, the magnetic field of a car, okay. So in the, in the, pre in the previous slide I told you that that is basically a rectangular object, right. So we are basically modeling the car as a rectangular object. Turns out, so that is a, seems like a crude approximation, but it turns out that this actually works very, very well, this function, okay. So uh, here is an example of experimental data um, from a, a, a Chevy Impala car and what we did is we measured the distance using a sonar sensor and we also measured the magnetic field and um, so if, uh, and then we fit a curve of this type to the data and you can see that the curve fits very well, okay. So the P over X plus Q function actually um, uh, fits the magnetic field of a car really well. So we are talking about the longitudinal distance from the car, okay. So here is a sensor and this, uh, so here is a magnetic sensor, there is also a sonar. So what we basically, what we are doing is really getting the car, having the car move back and forth and using this sensor to measure the distance, the actual distance and then also the magnetic field and so when we, when we plot the, the, dis, the magnetic field versus the distance, we get a curve that fits P over X plus Q, okay, okay. Um, and then we have done this for a number of different cars and for all of these cars it turns out that, um, you know, this is a pretty good model. Um, as long as we do not get, um, um, you know, we, so we cannot be too far from the car, okay. Um, now um, these are p-values for different vehicles, okay. So the p-values can vary quite a bit, okay. So that that is not going to be known, okay, okay. So um, so how do we use this for uh, measuring the position to the of the car, okay. Now first of all, what, where do we really want to use something like this magnetic sensor for measuring position of a car? So the idea is uh, basically that you would use this for uh, occupant protection type of applications. So basically um, in your car, right, you would have magnetic sensors all around your car. So these are very cheap magnetic sensors, the, the AMR sensors, an anisotropic mag magnetoresistive sensors that we buy, they are sub $10 each. So they are very inexpensive sensors. So because they are inexpensive sensors, you can have many of these sensors, you can distribute them around your car, right. You can have, uh, you know, four sensors or more than that all around your car. Um, and then if another car comes close to your vehicle, right, you would be able to measure the distance and the orientation of that car um, and then you would be able to uh, predict if there is going to be a, going to be an imminent collision, okay. 
So this is a very different kind of application than uh, radar and laser and those other kinds of sensors that, me that measure position, okay? Because radar and laser and so on, they measure distances at longer, they measure longer distances, you know. Uh, so a radar sensor might be uh, working all the way to 300 feet or 400 feet and so on, really long distances, right? And down to maybe 10 feet or something. But these sensors, on the other hand, are going to work only for, they work all the way down to zero. So right up to the time you have a collision, right? So they work all the way down to zero and then they work only up to about three to four meters. So they don't work at large distances. They only work at small distances. So you can't use them for doing adaptive cruise control or collision avoidance or those kinds of applications, right? This is not for those kinds of applications. So, so, so these sensors are more for um, protection of the occupant during unavoidable collisions, right? So if you're going to have a collision, right? If there is going to be a crash, there's nothing you can do to prevent it, right? It's an unavoidable collision. And so those are going to happen, right? Um, what you can do here with these sensors is you can detect that there is going to be an unavoidable collision and then you can take occupant protection measures. So for example, you know, those might be just tightening your seat belts, um, ex you know, maybe uh, uh, pre-inflating your airbags, right? And then there's a number of other active, uh, you know, occupant protection measures that can be um, initiated, right? So uh, external bumpers and um, seat movement as well as, uh, you know, movements of other um, mechanical systems inside the car. Those have been studied by a number of different groups, uh, right? So but typically they're studied as, as binary systems. They're just activated when a, when a collision, I mean, so they've, they've never really been implemented on any commercial car, right? But they've been, they've been studied. So uh, with these sensors, what you can do is you can basically detect if there's <coughs> going to be an impending collision, imminent, unavoidable collision, and then you can take these occupant protection measures. So th those are the kinds of applications that we are talking about with these sensors, okay? Okay, so, um, so the way we estimate position, so this is a one-dimensional application. Right now we are first talking about the 1D application. 1D application is longitudinal distance measurement, right? So the model is P over X plus Q, okay? So uh, what we can do is we can, um, use these variables for the state vector, okay? So, um, so the variables are position, velocity, and acceleration, and then these are the two parameters of the magnetic field model, P and Q, okay? So we have position, velocity, acceleration, and then the parameters of the model. Um, so those are your states, okay? And then you can have a kinematic model that describes how the vehicle is going to move, okay? And um, so this is the kinematic model. Okay, this is this, uh, the F matrix here. Um, so, um, and then your measurement model, the output equation, right? The, so the output, output is the variable that you're measuring, so that's the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is basically going to be X plus P over X plus Q, right? So this is, um, um, okay. There, um, yeah, I don't know where this came from, okay? <laughs> um, Oh, I'm, uh, yeah, okay. So, the, so these are the, these are the two, uh, the, the two variables that you're going to measure, okay? The two variables are P over X plus Q plus N. Right? N is noise. This is the magnetic field from the first sensor. This is the magnetic field from the second sensor, okay? So the second sensor is offset from the first sensor by a distance D on the PCB. So the D might be one or two centimeters, right? So, uh, so this is one magnetic field. This is the other magnetic field, the two sensors. So those are the measurements. So then, this, so this is your equation, and if you have an if you have a, a equation, right, um, a system dynamics equation, uh, and you want uh, to estimate the states, right? You want to estimate these variables given that these are the measurements. So you can use any kind of an observer. For those of you who have a controls background, right, you'd be able to understand this, right? So you would basically use an observer. Okay, you might use a Kalman filter. In this case, the equations are nonlinear because you can see it's one over x, right? So the output equation is nonlinear. So instead of a Kalman filter, you'd use an extended Kalman filter. Okay, so you use an extended Kalman filter, you'd estimate the states. Okay. Okay. You know, for those of you who don't have a controls background, I think the easy way to think about this is basically that. Um, 
you know, you have this equation here, x keeps changing with time, p and q do not change with time, okay. If you measure the magnetic field, right, you are measuring it every 1 millisecond, let us say, right. You measure it every 1 millisecond, so you get a lot of data in 1 second, right. Using all of that data, um, you can find not only x, but p and q, because you have got 2 measurements of b from 2 different sensors. So, you have got a lot of data. Uh, and two variables that do not change, so you can actually calculate all these variables in real time, okay. Okay. So, here is some um, experimental um, um, data here on position measurement. So, um, we have two sensors on a PCB, two magnetic sensors, and um, we have an experiment in which you know two different cars. So, because they are different cars, they have different magnetic fields and different parameters. Uh, what we want to show is how quickly we can estimate these parameters and how we can estimate position. So, basically this car comes close to the sensor, goes back and then leaves the scene and then the second car comes close to the sensor, goes back and leaves the scene. So, um, this is this is what this is what the magnetic field signals look like. Yeah. Um, and then we estimate the distance and so um, you can see that the distances are well estimated because the distance that we estimate from the magnetic sensors matches quite well with the sonar sensors, okay. okay. So, um, any questions, any questions about any of this? Okay, so let me ask you a question. Okay, why would you um, not use just use a sonar sensor? What do you think the advantage would be of all these magnetic? What are the disadvantages of sonar sensors? Line of sight. Yeah, you need line of sight. Um, you have, um, you know, slow updates in general with sonar sensors. Okay, so you can update them once every fifty milliseconds. Okay, once every fifty milliseconds is uh, not that fast, okay, because once every 50 milliseconds, you know, um, so you typically want uh, uh, for the kinds of applications that we are considering here, which is occupant protection, you know, you need to activate your, uh, your occupant protection system really, really quickly. So, you need to get, uh, you know, quick updates in order to be able to predict the collision and take action, okay. So, um, 50 milliseconds is not, is not very fast. Also, it's tough to have too many sonar sensors on your car; they interfere with, e with each other. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we can also do uh, two-dimensional uh, position estimation. Okay. So we so this is one-dimensional, right? So one-dimensional, we said we can find the position. Uh, we can also do two-dimensional. So. Um, uh, what happens in, in the case of two dimensional you need to estimate a number of uh, variables related to uh, the approaching car. So, it is a 2 D problem, right. So, when it is a 2 D problem you have x and y of the approaching car, you have the uh, you know um, you have the velocity which is basically the longitudinal velocity, you have the, the orientation of the vehicle and you have the angular velocity of the vehicle. So, those are all variables that you would want to estimate. Um, and so it also turns out that uh, the magnetic fields for 2D uh, in a 2D plane are very very uh, complex. Okay, so basically the orientation of the magnetic field is not the same as the orientation of the object. It basically depends on the distance and the relative orientation, and so you end up getting pretty complex um, functions. But what we found is that for this small region you know near the front bumper of the car, you can reasonably model the magnetic field um, with these two functions here. So, longitudinal uh, function is uh, p over x plus q, okay. So, this is the same as what we saw before. The lateral uh, function, okay, is basically um, a function that, that is related to y a, y a is the lateral distance from the vehicle, right and then it is also related to the longitudinal distance. So, you have this type of a function for uh, the lateral direction, 
okay and so um, so these approximations are valid in the region close to the front bumper of the car okay so why is the region in the near the front bumper of the car important because you know um, you know we, we might we might assume that that is the region that is going to bump into your car right so it might be a frontal collision or a rear collision or a side collision but it's still the front bumper of the other car that is that is um, banging into your car okay and so um, you know so we've done position estimation for uh, uh, this type of application so um, let me show you a video of a laboratory implementation of this one first So this is basically just a lab um, demonstration. So we so we have a Ford vehicle door that we used, and um, oops, I'm sorry, I don't know what I did there. Oops. For some reason, I'm not able to. forward or do anything like that. Okay, so this is a real time display of, um, of the position and orientation of the door and you can see basically that as the door is moved and uh, changed and its location changes, its orientation changes the estimate that uh, we are getting uh, changes accordingly. And then uh, we have also done tests with, uh, with cars in which uh, um, you know we had, car, we had the car moving towards uh, the sensors at a variety of different angles, different orientations and uh, you know for all the different orientations we estimated the parameters of the magnetic field model, the position, the velocity, the orientation and so on. Okay. So, um, so this is one of the applications we worked on with these magnetic sensors, you know how to find uh, position for occupant protection, okay. for detecting an imminent collision, for finding uh, occupant protection. Okay. Um, Okay, so then, it, then, a, then a different application that we worked on subsequently after that is um, basically finding the positions of pistons in um, pneumatic cylinders, hydraulic cylinders, IC engine cylinders and so on. Okay. So the idea is basically that you know you have an actuator, so in this case this is a pneumatic actuator, right. Um, you have a piston inside the actuator, so the piston is moving back and forth and as the piston moves back and forth, right. You measure the magnetic field using these magnetic sensors, and um, you measure, and then you find the real-time position of the piston inside the cylinder. And so you can you can do this. So we have done this for a free piston engine. Okay, we've done this for a hydraulic actuator, a number of different hydraulic actuators. Actually, we've done it for pneumatic actuators. Okay. Um, so the advantage of these sensors is basically that you don't have to put anything inside the cylinder. Right, you don't. I mean, you, it's not like um, um, you know a sensor that needs to be installed inside the cylinder. The sensor is completely outside, right? And so, using the sensor which is outside the cylinder, um, you can find the position. And you can actually turns out you can actually do it with sub millimeter accuracy. So, let me show you this video here. Okay, so there's a there's a ruler that has been installed on that board there, uh, and that ruler is just to dis just for display, just to show you what the real position is as the, as the piston is being moved back and forth in real time. So you can see that the position that is um, that the piston is at is the position that is indicated here in real time by the estimation system. 
and obviously the bandwidth is really fast you can find the position extremely quickly in real time okay so um you know so the so the and if you look at the performance uh, you can see that you get sub millimeter accuracy in the case of this pneumatic actuator okay you you're really getting hundreds of microns type of accuracy so very very accurate um, uh, measurement system so basically what we are doing is we are modeling the magnetic field of the piston right how does that vary with position we find that model okay we have an adaptive estimator and so we, we estimate the parameters of that model and we estimate the position in real time so the reason why we need to estimate the parameters of that model are because you know just like in the car application the parameters vary from one cylinder to another cylinder right even though the cylinders might be exactly the same same shape same size even then they vary from one object to another object and so therefore if you do this adaptive estimation you can find these parameters in real time and also find um, find the position so you can see estimation here of for um, you know different types of movement yeah okay so one of the questions that comes up um, for this type of application is what does a foreign object you know what is a foreign object a foreign ferromagnetic object what does that cause to the position measurement system so if I bring a magnet or some other um, ferromagnetic object right which has a strong magnetic field around it if I bring that close to the sensors um, so will I get a how big an error will I get will my sensor system stop working that's one of the questions that comes up and so it turns out that um, if you have redundant sensors and the more redundant sensors you have the easier it is you can reject the disturbances due to these foreign objects okay so um, so in this slide um, you know what I'm showing basically is um, you know so this pneumatic actuator is actually a very small cylinder it's the, it's the small it's like three or four inches in in length it's a very small cylinder right uh, and so we are and so the stroke is only like 50 millimeters and I showed you that we are estimating pos the position accurate to like hundreds of microns basically right so it's a very small system and so to disturb the magnetic field what we did is we took this um, uh, these pliers right and we br you know brought them close to the sensors and left them <coughs> near the sensors and um, what we did is instead of using two sensors we used three sensors right three in a line sensors so you're using more sensors that you than you need okay and what you have now is you have a, a disturbance in addition to the magnetic field and so what you want to be able to do is actually estimate the disturbance right so that you can then once you know the disturbance you can subtract it from your um, other magnetic field and so you can find you can find the position so you have one more variable that you need to estimate so you can actually do that and if you did not do disturbance rejection this is what would happen you would without the disturbance you'd be able to estimate position quite well but once the disturbance came in your position estimates would be off there's a big bias in the position right um, but then by having this extra redundant sensor and by using some additional disturbance rejection algorithms um, you know you can actually uh, quickly estimate the disturbance and then get rid of the influence of that disturbance so in spite of these in spite of these pliers here uh, you can estimate the position quite accurately okay so you can kind of be robust to all these ferromagnetic disturbances okay any questions yeah you said you needed two or you were using two um, without the disturbance rejection and then you use three with the disturbance rejection right is it possible to just use one uh, or why do you need two in the first place um, with one you won't be able to do the adaptive estimation of the parameters if you know the parameters of the magnetic field model then you need only one so then you basically completely know the model uh, you measure magnetic field you invert the model you find position so there's a one to one relationship between magnetic field and position but you if but you need to know that relationship fully including all the parameters but if you do, if you don't know the parameters and you want to adapt on them then instead of one sensor you use two sensors mm -hmm. and on top of that if you also have a disturbance then you go from two to three sensors mm -hmm. so for each extra baseline you need you need an extra sensor yeah okay
Okay. Yeah, so, um, you know, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit uh, before we leave this topic of piston position estimation. Um, so this research uh, that we did um, was originally funded by the ITS Institute uh, for the imminent collision prediction application. Okay. So, uh, you know, collision prediction for cars, um, position estimation, right. This is the project for which the, the research was funded. Um, but it turns out that the piston position measurement application is easier to commercialize, right. So it is very tough to, to sell a collision detection sensor. You know, I, you know, I cannot start a company and start selling a collision detection sensor. I am not sure who will buy it for me. Um, but, you know, piston position measurement, it turns out is, is, is way easier. First of all, it is a um, much easier application because it is just purely one dimensional, right? Just one dimensional motion, you are just trying to find the one dimensional position. So, it is an easier application and um, um, it could be an industrial application where you might have very few disturbances and so on. So, it is a, a more robust application. Uh, so, um, uh, it is a, it's a much easier uh, application for commercialization. And so, what we have done is we have, we have a startup company um, and uh, so, with this company what we are doing is making position measurement sensors for hydraulic cylinders, pneumatic actuators, industrial machines, you know like for example, um, uh, oil and gas type of uh, systems where you want to measure the, the height of liquid, right, or paint machines where you want to measure the height of liquid. So, these are all different kinds of position measurement applications where uh, which we can do using these magnetic sensors. And it turns out that this is actually a pretty big market, you know, there is literally millions of hydraulic and pneumatic actuators sold um, in the world every year, right. So, millions of them. And um, so, if even 10 percent of these um, actuators um, um, start having position sensors and so there is also a growing demand for having position measurement on these actuators so that you can do um, real time feedback, real time motion control. Uh, so, for example, if you have let us say an agricultural vehicle, right, uh, in which um, you have a, so it is basically, um, you know, a big tractor, right, in which you have an actuator that places seeds in the soil, right. So, basically you have an actuator that keeps placing seeds in the soil, okay. So, if you were able to measure the position of the piston, you would, you could make the, the actuator move to a, a, a definite depth in the soil, a controlled depth in the soil. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, depending on whether the soil is firm or uh, you know, loose and so on, you might, uh, depending on what the load is, you would end up moving to different uh, depths in the soil, right. So, likewise, all kinds of uh, hydraulic pneumatic actuators where you want to do motion control in order to, um, all the all the construction machines that you see around here, right. Um, uh, so, I have been looking at the, at, at the two big uh, earth moving machines that are right outside my office. And uh, so, all of those types of um, systems, they would all benefit from being able to measure position, right. So, for example, with an earth moving machinery, if you want to be coming back always to the same position to do something at that position, right, whether you are going to demolish a wall or whatever else you are doing, if you have position control, you hit go back and then the thing comes back to that position and so on, right. Um, so, um, so there is a, there's, there's an increasing demand for position measurement and um, so this is really a pretty large market here. And how do these sensors detect the liquids? Are, are there zero magnetic? You would, you, you have to have some kind of a magnet that, that mm -hmm. changes position with, uh, with the height of the liquid, yeah. I can tell you because we have filed for patent on all these things, so yeah. You basically, you have a some kind of a floating mechanism on the, on the liquid that has a magnet in it, mm. yeah. Okay. So, um, so then one other, so one other application here is on portable roadside sensors for traffic flow related measurements, okay. So, um, um, traffic flow measurement, so measuring how many, 
how many cars are going past a certain point in the road, right, the number of vehicles per hour per lane, traffic flow rate. Um, so you can imagine that magnetic sensors can be used for that, right? So each time a car goes past a point in the road, uh, you get a change in the magnetic field, and so you can count that a car has gone past that point. So you can do counting, okay? Um, but uh, you might be able to do more than counting. It turns out that you can also um, do classification with these magnetic sensors, right? You can um, classify the vehicle as being a car or an SUV or a truck and so on, okay? Also, it turns out that um, you, can, you can measure speed and uh, you can also um, uh, identify if the car is going straight or turning right. Okay. So the um, so these are portable roadside sensors. Uh, b um, so the idea is basically that it's something that you can carry and you can keep on the sidewalk. You can keep it next to the road, and be able to measure the traffic. Uh, so you know. So normally, what you do for traffic counting and related applications is. Uh, you have a inductive loop that is installed in the road, right? And then, so the inductive loop is powered, and then each time a car goes over that spot, you're able to detect the passing of the car. So that is a, that's a device that needs to be embedded in the road, right, in the center of the lane in the road. So this is a device, on the other hand, that does not need to be embedded in the road. It's portable, and so you don't really keep it in the center of the road. You keep it on the side, yeah? So here is an example of some data. So this is a quad arrangement of magnetic sensors. Um, what you have here is um, four sensors. Um, so they are, so you have some lateral separation between the sensors. You have some longitudinal separation. And then there is a fourth sensor, which has a vertical separation with sensor one. Okay? So basically, you have separation laterally, longitudinally, and vertically. Okay? Um, and this is some example of, of data. Uh, so for a couple of cars, um, what you see here, um, so the three curves here are, um, um, you know, these are triaxial sensors, okay? So they are measuring B, X, B, Y, and B, Z. So they're measuring magnetic fields along three axes, okay? So you have three different curves here. Um, so when the, when the car in the, uh, when the car is passing by the portable sensing unit, in the adjacent lane, you get a much bigger signal um, compared to when the car is passing in a non-adjacent lane. So basically, these sensors are uh, really only useful for measuring the traffic in the adjacent lane. Okay, so you um, so you can't really put uh, sensors on a sidewalk and measure the traffic in all the lanes. Okay, but you can just measure the traffic in the adjacent lane. Okay, so. Um, um, so you can do that. You can measure traffic in the adjacent lane. And it uh, turns out that because you have this um, lateral separation, longitudinal separation, and vertical separation, you can find, a, a find out a, quite a bit more info about the cars, and you can do some classification of the cars. Okay? So first of all, you can find the magnetic length of the car. Okay? So since you have longitudinal separation between 1 and 3, um, basically what you can do is you can find the magnetic length of the car. Okay, so you can what you do is you find the speed and you find the duration of the magnetic signal. Okay, the reason you can find the speed is you can um, you measure a magnetic signal here, you measure a magnetic signal here, and so one of them is going to be a time delayed version of the other. So what you can do is you can use cross correlation. You can maximize the cross correlation to find the time delay between these two sensors. And so when you find the time delay between the two sensors, you know the speed, right? So you know the speed of the car. And so if you know the speed of the car and, um, and you know the duration of the magnetic signal, you, you know the magnetic length. Okay? So you can find the magnetic length. Likewise, you can use sensors 1 and 4, and you can find uh, parameters related to the vertical height of the car. Okay? Um, the sensor 2, the reason why we use sensor 2 is mainly to reject signals from, non from the non-adjacent lane. Because what happens sometimes is, uh, if you have a really big uh, bus or truck come in the non-adjacent lane, 
Okay, it creates a big enough signal because it's a very big vehicle, right? So you you could easily confuse that big truck um, as a car in your lane because even though it's not in your lane, uh, it's it's creating a big magnetic signal. Um, but because you have uh, sensor two, what you can do is you can actually find the lateral distance, okay, of the car, and so by using that uh, variable, you can actually reject uh, errors from the non-adjacent lane. Okay. Um, so, so these are the four classes into which we try to uh, classify the vehicles. Uh, you know, sedans, uh, SUVs, buses, and then articulated buses. Okay, buses and two to three axle trucks, articulated buses and uh, really large trucks, basically semi-tractor trailers, and um, you know certainly it's it's easy to differentiate between classes three, four, and one and two. But it's m more based on the magnetic length, it's very difficult to differentiate between one and two. So one is uh, cars and two is SUVs. So it's, d it's difficult to differentiate between these two, based on magnetic length. But if you use height in addition to magnetic length, right? Um, then it turns out that uh, you can actually differentiate between these two, uh, between these two types of vehicles. Okay. So we have a number of papers on all of these topics. So this is one of the papers on the po portable roadside sensors for uh, traffic applications. And so you can, um, you know, if you're interested in these te uh, technologies, you can read about them. Okay. So uh, to summarize, as, the, as far as the performance of these traffic sensors, uh, we were able to achieve a detection rate of 99%, okay, in terms of accuracy of counting, okay, um, and we were able to uh, reject disturbances due to large vehicles passing in the non-adjacent lane by using the, this additional sensor here, the, the additional lateral sensor. Um, we were able to measure speed with an error of 2.5% over the range of 5 to 60 miles per hour. And we, so we basically verified that with GPS, uh, you know, by having GPS on the car and knowing exactly what the speed of the car is, comparing it with the speed that we measure and seeing what, uh, what error there is in that estimation. Okay. And then we were able to get 83% uh, accuracy in um, classifying uh, sedans versus SUVs. Okay, and finally, um, you know, this is um, our, the right counting application. So here, what we're doing is um, we have sensors in this corner here, and again, it's a quad set of sensors. And using this quad set of sensors, um, this this is a different quad arrangement than what we had earlier. But using this quad set of array of sensors, um, you know, so this is all entirely on one board. Okay, um, using this portable board, what we want to do is we want to count the number of right turns okay so there's three types of uh, scenarios that are going on so in lane 1 you can have cars that are going straight in lane 2 you can have cars that are going straight and then the third scenario is where i mean scenario 2 actually is the one where where this car makes a turn okay so you basically have cars going straight on this lane cars going straight on that lane and then cars that are turning okay and so you can differentiate between these three uh, types of scenarios So that concludes 50% of my talk, and uh, um, I won't take too much time on this one here. But um, you know, the second part of my talk is on uh, is on bicycles. Okay, uh, imminent collision warning system for bicycles. Mm -hmm. So um, initially, our thoughts were that on a bicycle, we would use uh, magnetic sensors, and along with some other sensors, right, and that would help us. Uh, detect if there is going to be a the, if there's going to be danger of a collision, okay. But eventually, it turned out that that was not a not a good idea. I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, so first of all, a little bit of a background. Um, there's over forty-eight thousand um, bicyclist car crashes every year in the U.S. and um, you know approximately seven hundred um, bicyclists um, died from these crashes so some of the data that's been found so this so these numbers actually come from um, the NHTSA uh, database 
um, but um, so the NHTSA database does not have a very good description of what I, uh, uh, you know what were the pre crash maneuvers and exactly how the accident happened. But there is a, a 10 year um, uh, study of crash of bicycle car crashes in the city of Minneapolis and so based on that report um, some of the things we found were that 41 percent of these crashes happened at intersections and another 40 percent occur within 50 feet of intersections. So more than 80 percent of bicycle car crashes happen close to an intersection. Okay. Um, the motorist fails to see the bicyclist in a large fraction of accidents. So that might be because either the motorist is not paying attention or maybe the bicyclist is not riding in a very predictable fashion. Right. So, um, um, so the motorist not seeing the bicyclist is a big problem. Um, the most uh, common pre-crash maneuver for bicyclists was bicyclists riding across the roadway. And what I didn't put down here is the second most common pre-crash maneuver um, is the bicyclist riding in the direction of the traffic, which means he's being hit from he or she is being hit from behind. Yeah. So those are the two most common types of pre-crash maneuvers for a bicyclist. Um, so basically we wanted to develop a system that addresses these types of crashes. Um, um, also we wanted to have a black box um, recorder on bicycles because uh, most often there is no data available uh, to analyze what happened in a, a motorist bicycle crash. So we do not really know what happened. Um, so there is an article about this uh, called is it okay to kill cyclists in, you know that was published in 2013 and so you can read that. Um, so the objective of this system that we developed is basically um, instrumentation for a bicycle sensor system for a bicycle that uh, predicts imminent collision. Okay. And when you detect a, p a possible collision uh, what you want to do is provide warnings to both the motorist and the bicyclist. So this is not occupant protection here. right? So that is one difference and that is why magnetic sensors are not very useful for this application because it turns out that um, you need to be able to measure uh, distances that are much larger in order to be able to uh, really prevent collisions. Okay. And um, so these collision warnings need to be provided to both the motorist and the bicyclist. right? So it is very important to warn the, the motorist. So the difference between the collision avoidance systems or collision warning systems that you see on cars and bicycles is that on a car what happens is your sensors basically look forward. They are forward looking you know radar, laser and those types of sensors. right? And what you are trying to do is you are trying to pre prevent a forward collision. So if, if the driver is uh, losing alertness, right, the driver is feeling drowsy or something, um, there might be a collision. And so what you are trying to do is see if there is a danger of a collision uh, and warn the driver that he or she needs to take some action. right? Um, but on a bicycle it is very, very different. We are, not, uh, we are not really so much concerned about forward looking sensors. We are not trying to tell the bicyclist do not run into the car. Right, so that is not the most important thing that you need to tell a bicyclist. Um, it, so the, co the, the crash scenarios are much more complex for a bicycle. Right? So a bicycle might be hit from the side, it might be hit from the rear. So the types of sensors that you need are you know, side looking sensors, rear looking sensors and then sensors that try to protect the bicycle from uh, crashes while the bicycle is riding through an intersection. Right? So those are the, so the m much more complex scenarios on a bicycle. Um, and also you need to warn the motorist more than you need to warn the bicyclist. right? So you know it is really the, the motorist who can take action, who can um, um, be much more effective at preventing the crash. right? So you need to, how will you warn the motorist? So I mean our approach is very, very simple. We just have a loud horn. right? So we detect that there is going to be a, a danger of a collision, sound a loud horn and hopefully that attracts the attention of the driver. Okay. Okay. So the challenges here are um, that um, you know like I said you need the bicycle needs rear and side collision systems, more complex crash scenarios, right. The motorist needs to be warned, um, you know the bicycle, it is not as important to warn the bicyclist as, as it is to warn the motorist. Okay. Um, 
And then it turns out that there is significant cost, size and weight constraints on a bicycle, right? So if you look at the LiDAR sensor on, a, on, on the Google self-driving cars, right? So um, the dome-shaped sensor on the Google self-driving car, that, ap that apparently costs $80,000. So it's uh, pretty expensive um, besides being big, right? So the kind of sensors that you can have on a bicycle have to be much smaller they have to be much, much cheaper, right? A um, couple of orders of magnitude cheaper than this. So you probably want to have all the instrumentation on your bicycle cost less than $500, for example, right? So, uh, so there's a significant challenge there from the sensing point of view, okay? So what we did is um, uh, what we've done, we have made a custom designed um, side sonar sensor with which uh, we can detect the distance and ori orientation of vehicles to the side of the bicycle. We have a rear laser sensor on a rotating platform. So basically we have a rotating platform. Um, so this laser sensor, it's very inexpensive, costs $89, okay? This, the sonar sensors are extremely inexpensive. Um, and we have the sensor on a rotating platform. And, and so what we do is we, control the motion of the rotating platform so that we can track the, the car as its lateral and longitudinal position changes, okay? Um, okay, so um, I think I have to stop at some stage. Um, so uh, should I go on for a couple of minutes more maybe or? Okay. Um, so the types of crashes that we're trying to address are, um, you know, rear collision crashes like this, uh, right turn at an intersection where this car might not see the bicycle and might uh, take, make a right turn and crash into the bicycle. And then, um, you know, so this is a situation where the bicycle is riding across and so this car turning left or that car could run into the bicycle, right? Okay. So the types of sensors that we have developed are a custom designed sonar sensor in the f near the front of the bicycle that looks to the left side. And the, the, so the unique pr um, uh, property of this sensor, it uses one sonar transmitter and two sonar receivers. The unique property is that it can measure not only the lateral distance to the side vehicle, but it can also measure the orientation of the vehicle, okay? And um, I'll just stop with this with this video here. Uh, I'll just show you this video. So, oops, I don't have my audio on here. That. Okay. So this is the car is passing straight, does not make a turn. The warning system does not provide any warnings. And here is um, when the, the car to the side makes a right turn. And you can see that you know, the warning system detects um, the turn very, very quickly uh, and is able to provide a warning. Okay. So I'm going to stop here. And um, you know, I have I was, you know, uh, more, uh, more slides on different aspects of the collision avoidance system, collision prevention system, okay? Um, in the couple of minutes that we have left, I'd like to open it up for questions. So does anybody want to ask anything for Professor Roger Manning? I have a question. Yeah. So with your um, magnetic sensors, um, can the magnetic sensors differentiate between a light crash and a heavy crash because you don't want the airbag to inflate every time Yeah, so that would probably depend on the delta V, basically the the relative velocity, um, right, of the of the crash. So yeah, you know, so um, what we've we've been able to do basically is um, kind of do some um, basic development on the sensor, and and show that we can use magnetic fields to find 2D position roughly, and 1D position quite accurately and so on, uh, to really evaluate this for a real occupant protection system, right? You would need a, you know, a, 
a test rig where you can do cr car crashes and all that stuff. So it's very difficult to test some of these things. Um, that's one of the reasons why you know I told you that the piston position measurement is a much easier application to commercialize than um, the car crash. But yeah, you would um, you know you could you you would certainly be able to measure the position and the velocity, the relative po relative position, relative velocity. So that can give you some some um, estimates of the severity of the collision. Yeah. Any other questions? So the range of distances over which um, you know the magnetic sensor is working is a very short distance, right, right. you know, a few meters around the car, and um, and so the lidar is obviously you know I think it's got like a 270 degree scan uh, angle or something, and so it it's looking at a very large field of view and tracking multiple objects. Um, um, also, the application, the intended application, is different, right? So, in way, so the lidar is for track, is for like following other cars, uh, or following the road. You know, if you're trying to f uh, follow the the markers on the road to stay in the lane and so on. So, it's for different um, different kind of application. Right. I, I guess my question was: Is is this uh, application more effective than in short range than Google's system, or do you not know? Well, uh, so if your question is, for the short distance application, is the magnetic sensor more useful than the than a lidar sensor? I think so. I think so. Um, the reason is, um, I mean, besides the cost issue, right? So yeah, cost-wise, you know, magnetic sensors are very cheap. Um, but besides the cost, um, and with what happens with the radar? And laser sensors, you know, which is what I know more about, um, they have a narrow field of view at short distances. At at a large distance, they can measure, they can track multiple cars and so on. But at a at a, at a at a short distance, right, because of the narrow beam width, they have a short field of view. Okay, so um, um, you know, magnetic sensors on the other hand have a broad field of view. Okay, so in addition to the fact that they are cheap. Um, and you can actually put many of them. They also have a broad field of view. Now, radar, you know, a single radar sensor is expensive as it is, a thousand plus dollars, and you can't think of putting multiple radar sensors because they have a, you know, narrow field of view. That would be not feasible. Yeah. Since we're a little bit after four o'clock, I think we'll end Professor Rajamani's seminar, and let's thank him for joining us today. Thank you. And I also want to note, um, please join us next week for Professor, or Assistant Professor Kathy Quick and Research Associate Guillermo Narvaez from the Humphrey School. They will be presenting on assessing roadway safety risks in American Indian reservations.